All right, so let's get started. We're in uh, chapter one, and I'm going to follow the textbook pretty closely, okay? I think it helps students if they know that this is our textbook, 14th, 14th edition by Hibbler on engineering statics or engineering mechanics statics. And so the outline for chapter one covers some very general topics, mechanics, fundamental concepts, etc. Let me just jump into it. So mechanics is a broad area. So after statics, you pass a class in dynamics where things move, where things accelerate, but in statics, things are stationary or they're in its, their current state of motion. It's not changing the current state of motion. And then after dynamics, you'll go to fluid mechanics, where in fluid mechanics, it's broken into statics and dynamics. And then solid mechanics is just a whole lot more of statics with some deflection, all right? But it's a foundational course in engineering. Do well in this course, the rest of the curriculum is manageable. I wouldn't say it's easy, but a whole lot easier. Barely scrape out of here with a C minus, and you're just destined to repeat difficulties throughout the rest of the curriculum, okay? It's just, just people that really master statics, it, it really helps them. Fundamental concepts. So Newton had uh, three laws, the first, second, and the third. The one that we all remember is the second. What is the second? It's not relatable to what's going on in this class. The first is, but what about the second? Okay, well, that's the first, actually stated very well. So if you have the sum of the forces equal to zero, an object that's in motion stays in motion, or if it's at rest, it stays at rest. That's the first law. But uh, the second law says when the sum of the forces isn't equal to zero, what can happen to the object? It can undergo a change in the state of motion. It can accelerate or decelerate if it's negative acceleration. All right? And then what about the third law? So we definitely use the first law in statics, and we actually use a lot of the second law, I mean the third law. What's the third law from Newton? Action, reaction. Yeah, and so what we're going to do is we're going to say if I take a, and put something that weighs so much onto a table, guess what the table has to do? Push back to hold it, support it, action, reaction. In stat, when it's a stationary, it makes a lot of sense. But even when you have something with motion, all right, you push, I feel it. All right, so uh, the forces are of the same magnitude in opposite direction. All right, collinear in opposite direction. Then we also have universal gravitational attraction. What is that concept? I've had two masses. It's kind of a miraculous thing. There's a little force where this F is equal to that F, and they're equal and opposite in their attraction, attracting each other. And then you say, in my everyday life, I'm this little dot sitting on this huge blob called the Earth with a huge M, and then we use that universal gravitational attraction force, that equation, to actually get us the weight. The weight. You've seen it all. I'm sure you have in your physics class. And so you find out that, oh, I can express the weight on the surface of the Earth as a product of my little mass, or the object of whatever, the mass of the object I'm interested in, times g. If I go to the surface of the moon, do I have the same g? Why? Did my mass change? No, but the mass of the object that I'm standing on, the Earth or the Moon, is much different, hence I have a different magnitude g. All right, so if things are at rest, they need to be supported equal to the weight, and the weight is mg. All right, that's a gravitational force. But if I let it go, what's it going to do? Free fall, isn't it? If I free fall and with neglecting wind, aerodynamic drag and anything else, just let it free fall the surface of the earth, then what is g equal to? It's rate of, help me here, come on, you pass physics, acceleration. Well, professor, I'm going to learn that when I get to dynamics. No, this is the stuff we should know like the back of our hand, right? So it's going to be the acceleration. All right, here's the first clicker question. So... I have to do this. 
So I'm going to give plenty of time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, from memory, what are the SI units of G? All right. Is there anybody that feels their clicker is still not working? Then I isolate you. Everybody okay? Everybody good? So then we'll just uh, close it out. And that's the way I grade it, right? All right. Then we just push that away. An object initially at rest is dropped after a time of 1.3 seconds. What is the speed of the object in units of meters per second, where G is either 9.81 or 32.2? Express your answer to three significant digits, only those with iClicker 2s. Alphanumeric will be able to do that. So make some calculations. You're in little teams. You can talk um, if you don't have one. And then go ahead and input the answer. Four seconds, three seconds. You ready? All right. Um, okay. So 12.8. 93% uh, of the class said that's the right answer, isn't it? And there's a few with the 16.6 .6 and 12 point. So what I do is I cal calculate that correctly. Okay. Now, somebody says, uh, but when I did the calculation, it's the time times the G, right? That gives me the V. And when I did it, I get 12.7530000. True? Now, you're asked to give it to one, two, three significant digits. And so that last digit can, needs to be considered for rounding or stays a seven. But it was a 5-3, so what do you do? Round up. What happens if it would have been a 12.741? It would be 12.7. Does that help? Your question? Yes, five is up. Yep, yep, yep. Five or more is up. Below that is down, or stays. It doesn't round up. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, finish this. Let's go here. Uh, what is the weight of an object that has a mass of 88 kilograms, where G is either in SI units or USCS units? And express your answer to three significant digits. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, I want the weight in units of newtons, in newtons, okay? Not kilonewtons, just newtons. Everything's time. So, 863, true? And if you did the calculation, it was 863.2, whatever it is, 3 or 828, right? And then, so you need to put it to three significant digits. Congratulations. Make sense? All right. Uh, you ready for another one? All right. Here it is. The weight of the object with a mass of 195 pounds. So the mass of the object is 195 pounds. But we want the weight. Now, I forgot to say what units I want the weight in. The book uses LBF. Sometimes it's subscript. I forget if this book subscripts the F or if they just LB without the subscript, LBF. I can't remember. What's the book use? Come on, half, the, half of the problems are in pounds. Uh, but we're, okay, they just use LB without the F, I think. But we want it in pound force, which is different than pound mass, true? So, yeah, they just use LB without the F or the M. Some books will use, this is LBM and this is LBF. To distinguish, I'm talking pound mass or pound force. So I want it in pound force, the weight in pound force of an object that has a mass of 195 pound mass. Got it? Okay. 
Start your calculations. I know it closed. It went over two minutes. I studied it like two and a half minutes. Well, look it. Uh, let's go ahead and see if anybody inputted. Okay. I'm looking for the right answer. 21% of the class is correct. Or those that respond, I should say. Five students have nailed it. All right, who are the happy five that can explain it to the rest of the class in their own words? Yes, please give it a shot. Thank you for volunteering. Please listen. On the surface of the earth, if you go to the moon, the weight changes because G changes, but on the surface of the earth, right? Okay, who, who else was one of the five? Yes, sir. You can look for a G sub C. It's kind of archaic, but it's a useful conversion factor, right? So if I have that uh, weight is equal to mg, I would divide by G sub C, and that's a reminder of the unit conversions that I need to do, right? Right, and so what was G sub C equal to? 32.2. Remember the units on it? Okay, uh, how about how about a LBM foot per LBF S squared? Is that G sub C? Is that right? If I take 195 pounds and put it on a scale and say, now give me the weight, what's it going to register? 195. All right, well, anyway. This is the right answer, isn't it not? So what about this G? You said weight is equal to mg, true? And G can be remembered as this is the rate at which it will accelerate if I drop it in the Earth's gravitational field. All right. But take a look. G is equal to the weight divided by m. Did I rearrange that equation correctly? And just think about it for a minute. If I take one pound mass and put it on a scale, it should register one pound force weight. You know what? G is often very useful, very easy to use. G is one pound force divided by pound mass. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't know why more textbooks just don't show that. Because a lot of times we use G to calculate the weight of something that's supported and not free falling. True? Is this good G or not? If you would have taken and said the weight is equal to mg, and I would have said 195 pound mass multiplied by G, which is one pound force per pound mass on the surface of the earth. Hey, you're making this class too easy. All right, let's press forward. Units of measure, everybody's seen this. You have length, you have time, you have mass, you have velocity, you have force. Some are called primary or fundamental. Some are called secondary and derived. This goes all the way back to high school. All right, some you express, once you have the dimension, you need to have units of measure for each of those dimensions. So you may talk of meters for length or feet per length. Or you may talk mass in kilograms or mass in pounds. Or force, let's say, what would be a good SI force, Newtons? What about force in USCS? Pound force, pounds, right? All right. Then this whole section goes and reminds us about prefixes. So a newton is different than a kilo newton. What is it? What's that kilo do? It's a thousand. So there's only a few of them we use all the time. The kilo, the milli, the mega, the centi every now and then. But we should know those. As well as rules, right? It's sometimes confusing if you have a mega milli or something. It's just. And uh, somebody says I have uh, 13, the length is 13 meters, right? But they say meters as a plural so some people may say oh yeah meters as in plural is that right how would you interpret this 
milliseconds. All right. How many people go to the grocery store, you look at something, you buy a five pound sack of LBSs? What? What do you mean LBSs? Five pound sack of potatoes or 10 pound sack of potatoes, right? And it's 10 LBSs. What is this S doing? Well, okay, some people pluralize stuff. You just have to know. It's common, but that's really not standard engineering. All right. All right. Dimensional homogeneity. How many people know what this is? Do you know what that is? So if you have, can you add apples and oranges? No. It, so if I have something like this, I have A is equal to B plus C. And if I know that the, the dimension of A is length, and maybe I like to think about it in units, like the SI units, maybe in meters, right? Then B needs to be length, and C needs to be length, because you can't have length per unit time combined with length. This is dimensionally inconsistent. So dimensional homogeneity says, if I have terms like this and I'm adding them and I'm equal to, they have to be dimensionally consistent. All right? All right. Please look at that because it will save you many, many times in your engineering career. Because it won't prove that you have a wrong answer, but it often will show that you have the wrong answer by the to checking the dimensions. Significant figures, we just talked about it, rounding off to the right number of significant figures, and then how to do calculations. It's a very good chapter to read. I wish most students at this level would read it and take it to heart, because you're going to do the same thing in your dynamics, your fluids, your solids, thermo, other classes. Here you go. Here's a question for you. It's a numeric response. Make the following calculation and express your answer to three significant digits. And we'll only give, you know, 40 some seconds. Everybody in? So let's take a look. Man, I like that, huh? This class needs to make it harder. No, we don't need to make it harder. All right, so let's do it with this one. Make the following calculation, express your answer to three significant digits. What is that COS? Cosine. Yes, sir. Your call. But that is what I'm testing right now. That's an excellent question. Oop, somebody jumped on that one. There was a nudge. I'll put it in the 16.5 quickly. So when you make the calculation, this is 16.546, and it's 16.5. Somebody says, calculate 78.4 times the cosine of pi over 8. So guess what you're going to have to do to your calculator? When I teach statics, first day I usually do this. It says, make sure you know what mode your calculator's in and how to make these calculations. There's probably a number of ways of doing it. How many people first computed pi over 8, which is 0 0.392699? That would be in radians. That has to be the assumption. It makes sense to be in radians. It then converted the radians using their calculator to 22.5 degrees, and then took the cosine of 22.5 degrees and then finish the calculation. That's one way. You could have done it that way. How many people, that, that's the way they did it? No? One? Okay, I think that's a reasonable way of doing it. Here's another way. They quickly converted the calculator from degree mode to radian mode, changed the, the calculator mode. How many people did it that way? One, two, the majority of them switched, right? Does your calculator have a quick conversion between radians and degrees? Mine does. Just go to mode and it does. Okay. So maybe most of you did it that way. Okay. All right. So let's do this. If you calculate, let's do the cosine of that multiplied by 78.4. What do we get? 72.432. True. And then we're going to put it to three significant. Hey. I don't know if anybody's learning. It's just like you already know what you're doing, and you're just doing it huh? as a class. So that looks good. Okay. 
So the very last section of this chapter, basically how to do, do analysis. Guess what? Your exams and the majority of your grade are problems. That's what it is. You have to solve problems, apply the theory. So basically, I've rephrased this into learn and how to pass this class, and I posted something like this already on Blackboard Learn. One is, and I really have found this to be more and more true, that people are not getting enough sleep. I look out during exam time. I know that you can be a little more sedate during exam time. People start yawning. They start almost laying their head down. If you don't get eight hours of sleep before the exam the night before, I don't know how you can do well. I really think this is getting up to my mind up near the top, number one. Well, I'm going to caffeinate myself out the wazoo, right? Buy one of these 20-gallon uh, caffeine drinks. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just go to bed. Go to bed. Go get some sleep. Get at least eight hours before. Also, walk. Do a little exercise, swim, something. A healthy body and a healthy mind go hand in hand. Uh, eat right, treat yourself right, go to sleep. And I, I really think a lot of people, they tell me, I don't know why. I studied, 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 and then I get your test. Your test, Montoyville, your test is, is I can't, I just blank out. Well, let me talk to you a little bit here. Oh, you stayed up all night. Yeah, I needed to study all night. So when's the last time you went to sleep? I don't think my test did it. I think your lack of sleep did it. So get some good sleep, eat right, exercise, attend every lecture, engage in the lectures. Thank you for those who've already engaged. Some of you I'm going to still work on. I'm going to earn your trust. Okay? I'm going to try and get you to engage with me. Uh, don't be distracted. When you're in class with the texting, blah, 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 studying, doing homework, I've seen many people, you know, like, oh, I'm studying. Yeah, well, you're not studying. You're, you're texting every time there's a distraction going on. You need to really be distraction-free when you're doing things. All right. Ask yourself questions about what you're learning. Think about it. It's, it's like metacognition. It's, it's just thinking about learning. Think about what you're doing. And that pays huge dividends. If you then can articulate it to a neighbor, I want you to work in teams, and then maybe explain why your answer or your approach or their approach, you know, critique it. Think, talk about what you're doing. Okay, uh, work all of the problems you can. Don't just read the textbook solution. And people tell me, oh, you got videos out. I watched your, every one of your videos three times. And I still bomb your test. I said, stop watching the videos. <laughs> do it. Do it yourself with a blank sheet of paper. You know, the blank sheet of paper is your best friend when you're practicing for an exam. Not where you're reading your solution or somebody else's solution. That is the wrong way to study. Go with a blank sheet of paper, start and resolve that problem, being more organized, being a little clearer to yourself, talking yourself through what you're doing, why you're doing it, because if there's a little change to the problem on the test, you don't want to get tripped up. You want to be able to do it. Work all the homework problems, work extra problems, and do not get this. A lot of people are just, well, I'm just, every time I'm stuck, I'm looking at the solution manual or somewhere else. All right. When you, re when you practice redoing problems, make sure you go for efficiency and organization. And oh, by the way, I've had a lot of people even, this is a little discouraging to me. Somebody says, oh, well, I hate to say it, but at the end of the semester, you, you got a D in this class. You're going to have to retake it. It really upsets me when the person goes, well, that's okay. I wasn't really trying anyway. What? What? You weren't really trying anyway? Well, no, I was taking nine other hour classes and I was working 40 hours a week. Hey, if that's the boat you're in, do yourself a favor, get your tuition money back or as much as you can now, call it quits, all right? Believe me, you need to devote time to pass any engineering class, but especially statics. I remember when I took statics, it's been a while. It was vicious. It was vicious, it was difficult, all right? So please, if, you, if I didn't have the time to devote it, I would have not passed it. It's a very difficult and challenging class. 